And when we are in the big blind and we have the bigger stack, we want to be raising seven big blinds actually which is insane i think i'm the only guy that does that i've probably seen one player that does this at my stakes so it's a uh, something that we can use to exploit big time by registering for a free trial account you can personally experience the depth of our platform This part three of this series, we'll be talking mostly about blind v blind and final table adjustments. So let's get it started. First, I wanted to mention a few stuff of the blind v blind adjustments when we are covered. I started by talking about this the last time, but here are a few things I didn't mention last time. So when you're covered, you're the shorter stack. If you suspect villain is rarely isolating, you should start also open jamming more as a short stack because this is the way to maximize your EV of the strong hands. After all, we exploit his passiveness and since it's a bounty, he still needs to go wide for our bounty when he covers. So this is uh, the reason we want to be taking the initiative. From the big blind and the lower our bounty power is, the more often we non-owing ISO and vice versa. So basically this is because the small blind won't limp fold too often because he has incentive to go after our bounty post flop. So we don't want to reduce the SPR too much and allow him to go after this bounty. And also our bluffs are going to be way stronger compared to GPV in this example. And then the last point, a lot of people open raise too much strong hands as big stack and open limp too uh, much trash hands in the small blind. I think this is still very true about most takes. So we can exploit this by ISO raising more bluffs, no, no win. And also a cool strategy is to use a big sizing like 4.5x with uh, 15 to 25 big blinds. I think this is the stack depth where people are the most unbalanced and they have the weakest range. When you have 20 big blinds, for example, you have big bounty power and the small blind who covers you just limps. They're full of shit most of the time, so we can exploit that by going after it with a big size. So we don't allow them to go hands like jack seven off, queen six off. We want to make sure they fold those. Okay, let's go to the first example today. So we're going to be having a look at the blind v blind, 18 big blinds for the small blind, 42 for the big blind. We'll be seeing comparison between PKO and GPV, the same scenario. 1842. So in this example, we see the small blind has about 1.4 bounty power, which I would say is medium, slightly high, and the big blind covers him with a big margin. So in this example, I actually want to show you nono win race first team for the small blind first, and we're going to compare this to GPV. Okay, so this is the first range. First thing I notice is we almost have non-existing nono win race first team range here being covered in a bounty. It's only 3.6%. We do open fold a lot, 22%, and we mostly play limp or jump, that's it. Because if we race, we give big blind a lot of reasons to go after our bounty and to just go and play in position, which is great. So great for him, I mean, so we don't want to give, it, give him this option. What happens if we see the GPV race first team? Okay, so those are the two ranges on the left. You see 18 big blinds in bounty tournament. When we are covered, we have 3.6% race first team, 12.3 jumps. And here on the right, we fold 5% less. We limp 15% less, actually 12% less limps. And we have about six more times non-no win raises. So this is very significant. And you can see also another difference is in our open jamming range. We do jam these hands that have pretty good equity when caught, and they mostly rely on the fold equity. But here, uh, as we have already discussed in the previous webinars, we cannot jam these hands because we're getting caught with a lot of hands that are ahead of us. We have less fold equity, so we, we go with the strong hands instead. Okay. Uh, what else can I show you about this example? So let's see the comparison between limp jam in the small blind versus nono win ISO. Versus ISO. So we're looking at this range. This is GPV and let's compare to the bounty scenario. Okay. Yep. This is the range. On the right, actually, we have the bounty scenario and on the left is the vanilla scenario. So first of all, in the vanilla, we actually limp fold way more. So 21% limp folds, 
compared to 12.5% lymph nodes. This is first because we started by open limping much stronger range than before. So we have less weak hands in the range on the right in the bounty scenario. And then the big blind has more incentive to jump. Actually, we jump more often against big blinds arrays. In this example on the right, we have 11.7% limb jump compared to 67 This is because big blind has wider value range because he covers us in the bounty. And uh, when he has wider value range, we actually are getting caught uh, more often. So we generate higher EV by limb jumping bigger part of our strong hands. So in this example, we limb jump any pair. We have some weird limb click race basically with queens and aces only, which, which is something we can just skip. We can just play by limp race, maybe limp co aces and kings, that's it. And pretty much any strong hand, we always limp jump here in, in, on the right in the bounty. On the left, do you have a lot more limp races, no, no win. This is fine because in the vanilla scenario, he doesn't have the bounty chips to go after. So we have more fold equity and his range is also more uh, weaker, more polar on the left. So uh, can get away with limp raising small and putting the decision on him. Okay, what else can I show you about this example? Yeah, let's look at the big blind ISO percentage when we limp and compare it to the vanilla scenario. Okay, so this is the uh, big blind isolation versus limp in the bounty scenario. And let's take the same exact example, but for uh, vanilla. Okay, so this is in the vanilla example. Let's see both ranges. So I'll try to keep the bounty ranges uh, from now on on the left. Sorry about the last example. So what do we see here? On the left is the bounty example, on the right is the vanilla example. So we have 40. 9% pretty much checks compared to 56% checks. He, uh, villain wants to check less often in the bounty example, of course, because uh, he wants to reduce the SPR, he wants to go after our bounty. And also because villain wants to allow us to play post flop, so he can reduce the SPR and go after our bounty. This is a reason for uh, seeing less ISO jumps compared to Vanilla. Like in the Vanilla, he's ISO jamming 12.6%. Here he's ISO jamming in the bounty under 10%, which I would say is a bit unintuitive, but uh, he actually wants to make sure we, we stay in the pot and play post flop against him. So this is why he raises 2.5 big blinds in this example with a very, very wide range. Also, another reason for not ISO jamming as much is uh, because he knows we open fold more hands. Therefore, uh, when we limp, our range in bounty is it's actually stronger than vanilla. So uh, he can't just go with a lot of hands. Uh, he can't just ISO jump. You can see that he has some suited eights here as part of his bottom ISO uh, hands. And those are not bluffs. He's actually race calling them. And there is no uh, suited bluffs for under 30, 35 big blinds in general. In bounty, when you cover villain and he limps in the small blind, you don't bluff anything suited. Uh, whenever you raise a suited hand, you just go with it, play for stacks. So these hands are just part of big blinds, very wide value range. And his bluffs come from uh, the offsuit section. You see a lot of mixing hands, but the majority of his bluffs is kind of concentrated in this middle part, like the offsuit 5x to 8x, basically. And here it's a little bit split on the right, but he doesn't uh, raise such high frequency hands like queen 7, queen 8 on the right in the vanilla example. He raises more uh, weak hands like uh, the offsuit 7, 4, 7, 5, 8, 5, 9, 5, these kind of hands. The reason for this is because, as I mentioned earlier, we actually started by open folding more in the bounty scenario. And when we do that, we're actually more willing to call his ISOs because our range is stronger now. So Villain knows that and he's trying to be one step ahead by raising stronger hands. He wants to be better prepared to play post flop against us, basically. So let's see what the big blind does when we limp jump, how often he's calling in both scenarios. Let's compare. So, oh yeah, first PKO. I'll try to remember that. So big blind versus limp race. Let's have a look versus limp jump. This is the range we're looking for. And then 
This is actually a really cool tool I found out the compare to. It's super useful. Okay, so let's have a look at those two ranges. So the limp for uh, actually the race fault is kind of similar 64% for the vanilla scenario, 57.5% for the bounty scenario, which looks to be pretty close numbers, but it's actually not true if you have a second look. And if you remember, we saw that the big blind isolates way more non-owing in the bounty scenario compared to the vanilla scenario. So first of all, his ISO range is way wider, like about 50% wider. So if you see like 57.5% faults here and compare it to the 64% here, this is misleading because we're talking about completely different ranges. You can see that no suited hand is folding, no pair is folding as well. And the value starts from basically the offsuit tens. We ISO jack 10 off and then call a jump. Comparing this to on the right, we when we ISO a hand like queen jack off, we have to fold it. So this is how much wider we can go in this example. And this is very important. What do I think population does different from this? I do think people ISO jump way more hands that they're supposed to be inducing with. As the big blind, I think they ISO jump hands like King Jack of Queen Jack of they, they basically have weaker non win ISO range. And I don't think I've seen enough of these suited 8x, suited 9x, uh, ace4 suited non win ISOs. I just think people check those type of hands, which is a leak and uh, we should be adjusting properly. Okay, let's get to the next part of the presentation. Okay, so adjustments when we are the bigger stack. And then we'll see an example related to this. So first of all, when the small blind, from the small blind, we open limp less when big blind bounty power is high. This is of course when we cover him and we switch our strategy towards more and more raises. And if his bounty power is really high, let's say close to two or over two, we just start open jamming way more. Second part, a small blind wants to limp call more often, no no win eyes or raises when the bounty power is high up to two thirds of his limp range for bounty power two. And uh, if the stacks are short, of course, this is self-explanatory. Up to 30, 35 blinds effective. Big blind has no suited ISO bluffs. We just witnessed that. I can add to this that he still has some suited ATX raises as we just saw. And it's important to have a really wide ISO range for value. The bigger stack blind v blind in PKOs wants to generally use big race for steam or ISO size to be able to reduce the SPR maximally. This is actually very unintuitive part of the game. For example, when the small blind is the bigger stack for a, a relatively high bounty power, we want to be raising 5.5 big blinds for steam for 50 blinds effective. And when we are in the big blind and we have the bigger stack, we want to be eyes were raising seven big blinds actually which is insane i think i'm the only guy that does that i've probably seen one player that does this at my stakes so it's uh, something that we can use to exploit big time this is for 50 uh, big blinds uh, plus effective and also like for shorter stacks for 40 big blinds uh, from the small blind we can raise like 4.5x from the big blind we can raise like 4.5x as well and then for 30, 35, we can stick to 4x. And then uh, when the stacks are under 30 big blinds, then we play closer sizes. We use closer sizes to what a vanilla size would be. Let's jump to the example. We'll be looking at uh, blind v blind, 32 big blinds for the small blind, 22 for the big blind. And we'll compare to GPV. Let's have a look. First of all, we, we find the bounty examples. So let's compare the open fold, open jump and race first team. In this example, the big blind has 1.1 bounty power, which is uh, once again medium. It's not so high, but I think this is actually an example uh, that we'll be encountering way more in our uh, actual games when we play. So I wanted to focus on something which is realistic and uh, which is going to be very useful for everyone. So let's see blind v blind comparing the first team. Yeah, open fold, open jump, and race first in. So comparing this to the GPV, this is the example. Okay, let's have a look. On the left is the bounty, on the right is the vanilla. So first of all, we fold 5% less in the bounty scenario, 11 to 16. Then we open jump more 
12.8 compared to 7.7. So this is 5% more jumps, which is significant. It's almost double the open jump. And then we have also 5% more raises. We basically limp 5% less pretty much. 6.5% less limps and this goes towards non-win open race. So this is once again for 1.1 bounty power, which is, I would say, very common and average. So this is not even extreme example. If it was extreme example, we would be seeing less open faults. We would be seeing more open jumps and more non-win races. Okay, let's have a look at the big blind response versus race in both examples. Okay. Let's have a look. So first of all, we see a similar fault, which is kind of expected because the left example in the bounty villain's range is weaker. So we want to be folding a little bit less. And what's interesting on the left is actually comparing this to the right, we have literally zero three bets non win We only play call or jump basically, apart from the faults. So yeah, and uh, when we jump, we stop having these bluffs like king five off, queen six off, these gangster bluffs, king three, king deuce off. We don't see that in uh, in the bounty scenario. We do see a lot more value hands, a lot more uh, basically linear range. Let's have a look at another comparison. We'll see small blind response versus iso jump. So on the right we have the vanilla, on the left we have the bounty. What's interesting here is actually he fought 7% more pretty much on the right and uh, he doesn't want, he wants to stick around and to, to go after the bounty on the left. We see all these bottom uh, defense, uh, he limp calls, hands like 5-4 off, 6-5 off, 7-6 off, all these offsuit sixes which are clear faults here. And uh, of course, any suited hand is good enough, uh, while on the right, he, he's still folding some suited hands. But if we imagine a spot where villain has the same non win ISO sizes in a vanilla and a bounty scenario, it kind of makes sense to play a wider range versus this ISO when we cover him and he has a decent bounty. I just wanted to point out what's the region that we expand. We basically don't fold any offsuit king, we barely fold any offshoot queen, like just the queen use off. And this is uh, much wider compared to the seam on the right where we uh, we defend as bottom queen six off, here it's queen three off. Okay, so what else can I show you? Big blind co versus jam. Uh, yeah, 60 more combos someone pointed out in the chat. We play 60 more combos here. Yeah, because they're offsuit combos, but there are a lot of hints in total. So let's have a look at the ISO jump on the left and on the right. So his ISO jump on the left is once again strong hands. He has, I don't know, for some reason Queen 6 suited always wants to stick it in with limp jump or open jump. So this is a hand that uh, Sover really likes to mix in. I think this is probably not very important to memorize. It's all about the right hand classes. So in this example, we limp jump the mid pairs. Uh, we try to limp race any pocket pair we, we have, either by a limp race non -no win the example of jacks, tens and nines, or just a limp jump with fives to eights. And then we, we limp jump the top of our range, the offsuit and suited aces, and mix in some ace deuce, ace three suited. Why do we pick ace deuce and ace three suited instead of, let's say, ace seven, ace eight? We, we actually mentioned that we want to be playing pretty linear range, but these hands seem odd. The reason is because we already know that the big blind isolates no no win hands which are in the middle, like offsuit 8x, offsuit 7x, offsuit 6x, which means that his race faults in the big blind shoes, they come from hands in the middle, like 7x, 6x, 8x, which means that he doesn't have so many bluffs which contain a deuce or a three. So this is the reason we want to be limp jamming ace deuce ace three, king deuce king three, even in the bounty scenario, because he just, we don't interact with his bluffs. And if you think about it, if you call him like ace deuce suited and uh, he was bluffing jack seven off, he still has very decent equity and position against you. This is the reason we see these combos. And last in this example, compare the big blind co versus jam. And let's have a look at the adjustments we can make there.
we see that we, uh, we go a little bit wider and it comes from the suited 9x basically and we we cannot be folding pretty much any ace any suited ace here i think actually in practice this might not be the best approach from my experience when uh, somebody covers you in the small blind and you have 22 big blinds or 21 blinds behind you in the big blind i think people just open jam way more a weekend than they're supposed to so i think in practice even if we play any ace uh, even if you play hands like king eight suited full frequency queen jack off this should be fine because people just they see your bounty and they say okay i can just jump and uh, put an end to the action and put a decision on villain and that's what what happens they also open race no no win i think bigger part of their value range let's have a look once again at what his value range is supposed to be so i think in reality, people won't be jamming a hand like Ace Jack off, Ace 10 off for 22 big blinds, even Ace 9 off. I, I have seen these uh, hands play slim jumps or just open raises, and they would be jamming way more of these hands, like suited connectors, maybe some more King 8 off, Jack 10, Queen 10 off. This is what I see mostly. Maybe some more weak kings, uh, middle queens, which results in them having way weaker open jam range. So in reality, I think we should be way, way wider when we call a jam in this scenario, even without taking into consideration how good the future game is for us. When we double up here, we cover basically everyone but the hijack, the next hand. So this would be ideal scenario for us. Actually, one of the biggest adjustments I, I was planning to mention in the previous part of the webinar, but I forgot about, is we try to induce way more in bounty covering compared to vanilla. And this goes mostly for 4-betting, when we face a 3-bet, when we face a squeeze, we 4-bet a hand like ace-queen, for example, we would 4-bet to induce in a, a bounty scenario compared to when we just squeeze jam in a vanilla scenario for, let's say, 60 big blinds. Uh, this would be a good example when we also face a race in a 3-bet, we also code 4-bet non-no-win with a wider range for value. This is very important, make sure to induce a lot and we will see very cool examples about this in a minute. So let's talk about the final table adjustments that we are supposed to be making. The lower risk premium dictates closer to GPV plays. This is very important. I think a leak nowadays in population tendencies is people don't realize the difference enough between a final table PKO and a regular final table. So they kind of play a similar strategy, which is a big mistake. This first point, this includes wider race first in, a wider cause versus race first in, wider defense versus tribet, lighter stack offs versus jumps and squeeze jumps. What else? We actually can get away with a lot more tribet bluff jumps in a vanilla final table because we will be facing less calls. In other words, we can put a lot less pressure in the mid and short stacks when we are a big stack at the PKO final table because the future game is very strong for mid and uh, short stacks, so they are willing to risk more. And it's a combination of having two prize pools and being so close to the moment when we win the tournament that we actually want to play a little bit more liberal and I want to stack off lighter. We also see some flat calls versus let's say somebody opens and there is a tribet. In a vanilla final table, we would never see a flat call in position from the chip leader. While in PKO final table, there is a pretty big range that the chip leader, let's say he has the button, he actually can uh, code call uh, a lot of hands there, which is non-existing range in a vanilla scenario. We get to the second point, bubble factor is always one or higher in a vanilla final table, but can be under one in PKO even at the final table. Bubble factor one uh, means GPV ranges, it's exactly zero ICM impact. And if it's over one, this means there is some ICM impact, it can be very high. Two or more is usually when you see the clash between second in chips and chip leader at the final table, of a new final table. This would be usually above two, which indicates that uh, the second in chips has to play a very tight range. So under one means can uh, call so light a jump, for example, that uh, we actually call wider than GPV. So uh, this means that 
whenever somebody has the bigger stack, he has a smaller bubble factor versus the short stack. So they lose their fold equity to him. And this allows the big stack to open wider and co wider uh, versus jumps. We get to the third point. The short stack, just as a vanilla final table, needs pay jumps. He can't collect bounties at these points. He has lost his fold equity, so he must tighten up when jamming first in or uh, basically when he's playing uh, any spot. The shortest stack is the only player who has pretty much the same bubble factor in both final tables. If we compare the same final table for uh, Bounty and Vanilla and uh, take the same stacks, the short stack has the same bubble factor. Only advantage is uh, being the short stack in a Bounty final table compared to a Vanilla one is that he'll get the double up easier now because he's getting caught by weaker ranges overall. And let's get to the last point. The biggest stacks generally extend their ranges by 35 to 50%. This is a combination between the average bounty power at the table, how big are the bounties of the short stacks, and of course, uh, the position of the big stack. And also the margin by he covers the remaining players is very important. It would be a one example where you have 60 big blinds, you're the chip leader, but there are a few stacks with 45 blinds behind you. And uh, it's completely different if you have like 100 big blinds and the next in chips has 35. So you can imagine we can be very white in the second example. And of course, the later his position is, the bigger is first team percentage he'll have. It's a very dynamic final table, the PKO final table, as the short stacks have to adjust all the time by being tighter than, than vanilla because they have less fold equity. And the big stacks, they have to adjust all the time when, when they cover by a big margin. So I think these final tables, they, they allow a lot of edges to be gained, basically. And in general, it sucks more to be a short, the shortest stack at the PKO final table compared to a regular final table. Okay, what example we'll be looking at first? Final table, PKO versus vanilla. Yeah, I wanted to, to make sure I take an example which is pretty common. So 38, 32, one second to find it. Yeah, so this is the example. We'll be looking at first the big blind core range versus the button. Okay, so in this example, the button is the shortest stack and he has the second biggest bounty in play, which is insane. I think the bounty power is not shown for some reason still for this PKO final table because it's a new feature and I'm sure they're working on it. But you can imagine that the button has a significant bounty power here. So let's have a look at what the big blind plays versus the button. And we'll be checking both ranges for the bottom first team and for the big blind. And let's compare this to a final table where we don't have a bounty in play. This is the example. Yeah, this one. Big blind versus button. Okay, let's see. So first of all, in the bounty version, this is what the shortest stack has to play. He only jumps 28.4%. And this is a very strong range, super linear range. Even though there are just two players remaining after him, he's playing so tight. And this is uh, what he can play in a vanilla scenario with the same uh, stacks remaining. So he's way wider here. He's basically jumping 9% more which is significant when we're talking about 28% range. And on the left, we see big blind calling range in the bounty scenario compared to the vanilla scenario. So uh, any two is uh, what we see on the left, which is kind of uh, not, not surprising, I would say, because the button has the second biggest bounty in play. And here is uh, the range he's supposed to be playing in a vanilla scenario versus a weaker range. So even though the range is weaker on the, this example, from the button, uh, the big blind still only calls about one third of the time. So this is the first thing we need to see. And then uh, let's have a look. This is a very interesting final table. Actually, I have a lot of stuff to show you about it. So uh, let's have a look at the small blind first team strategy. Yeah, this is a very good example. Let's compare this to the regular final table. Uh, this is the one. Okay, so on the left, we have the bounty. 
and on the right we have the vanilla. I think these two ranges have nothing to do with each other. The only thing that's kind of similar is the open folds. And I think this is another topic, but I think population probably limps a little bit more and uh, basically has a weaker limping range and open jumps a bit more than this. So uh, when they limp, we have to attack them more in the big blind, but that's a completely different topic. So first of all, in a vanilla scenario, we when we have 12 big blinds and the big blind has 32 in the final table and we are not last in chips, we have some ICM pressure on us. So we're not allowed to limp anything. We're basically uh, open raising the bottom of our range and uh, the top of our range, and then we jump the rest, and that's it. On the left, however, we have zero non win raises, and we open jump like the top of our offsuit uh, hands, and some of the better suited aces, and the rest we limp. And of course, some of the low pairs, the rest uh, of the range we limp. And this is very curious example that we see here. Very nice comparison, I think. Oh yeah, this is uh, this is a cool one. Let's uh, let's have a look. How does the small blind play versus button jump compared in both scenarios? We see that we don't have any flat calls. This is the first difference. And the second one is on the left, we play 38%. On the right, we play about 20. So this is almost double the range. We we really want to go after his bounty because he's the only stack we cover at this point. First of all, and second of all, uh, the risk premiums in general are way lower in a bounty final table compared to a regular one so this allows us to go here with queen six suited king deuce suited king seven off and this is actually the tight version of our range because in this example the big blind covers us almost three times so he's definitely going to join uh, with the wide range here and even though that's going to happen we still go with uh, such hands on the right we actually are allowed to have a flat and then fold range. We still play the majority of the time with uh, ISO jamming, but uh, when we flat, it's basically the worst of aces and the top range. And that's it. We we can co-call the top range and co fold the bottom. But here, that's not an option anymore. Now let's have a look at something else. I wanted to show you the low jack versus high jack Tribet, how does the low jack respond versus a tribet? Let's see. So the low jack in this example has 42 big blinds and the high jack has 18. This is the first example. Okay, this is the second one. So on the left, when we face Nono in Tribet from the hijack, who has 18 big blinds, uh, let's have a look on the right first. So first of all, we don't, we fold a lot, like we fold 54%. Even though on the right, our uh, race first in the range is much tighter in general, you can see, you can see the dark sector here. Uh, we open race in a vanilla scenario, King four suited as the bottom. Here it's queen three suited in a bounty, jack five suited compared to jack eight suited. So we're, first of all, we're playing much wider range first in. Let's actually open this to show you in a better way. Okay, so the high jack first in, low jack actually first in. In the bounty, he's opening 42%. This is uh, very, very wide range, but he covers everyone behind him. Basically, when the chip leader folds at some point at the final table, the second in chips becomes the new chip leader kind of and thinks, takes over his role and raises the wide range. So this is what happens here. We have 42% raise here compared to 
what's it? One sec. Compared to 29%. So this is basically about 50% wider range to start the hand with. And then we, we defend versus the hijack. One second, I wanted to show you the hijack range. Uh, what he does when we open. Okay, so here the hijack, he's mostly playing by jamming because he only has 18 big blinds. His bounty is kind of small though, and this is the reason why he can still uh, 3 bet no no win, 3 bet small, basically 4, 4.5 big blinds. But he, he 3 bets in the bounty version 3% and 3 bet jumps 9%. So, versus this 3% range, which is kind of strong, on the left, we defend almost any suited king. Most of our suited queens, any suited 8x, you see a lot of gappers, non-dominated hands, we play any pair basically by jamming or uh, defending. And we even call a hand which is very intuitive, like case 9 off, ace 10 off, king jack off sometimes. This is huge difference from what we call on the right. So once again, I, I want to mention that on the right, we, we have started by open raising way stronger range, and yet we we defend so much tighter. So another thing, yeah, the four bet jamming is kind of tighter on the left, which makes sense because on the left, villain has bounty and he's going to be playing a much tighter range to three bet no no win. I want to show you what he's going to do in the same scenario when it's a vanilla. So yeah, for some reason in the vanilla, he's Bubble factor versus low jack is actually 1.8, which is kind of high. So uh, he's much tighter in general. And yeah, he played 12% there. He's only playing 9% here. In terms of combos, it's pretty similar range actually to what we see in uh, Bounty Final Table. This cannot have a huge difference between those two ranges because the range is so tight that it's almost possible to, to see a huge deviation here. But uh, what's the most shocking is the hijack, uh, low jack defense versus uh, three bet in this example, who is out of position and is facing 18 big blind stack three bet. Okay, so let's have a look at another example. I want to show you, yeah, hijack three bet range in general. Yeah, let's have a look at this one. Okay, so uh, this is the hijack. Oh yeah, uh, Georgi mentioned that uh, there is a text under the... Yeah, I'll, I'll have a look at this. There is a text uh, when I compare the ranges, so we, we actually uh, get more information about what we're looking at. So uh, this is the hijack, what he's uh, three bad calling basically at the PKO final table. So he has 18 big blinds, he's 3-bet calling the majority of the time when he 3-bets, and uh, he's stacking off ace-jack plus and basically 7s plus. That's it. And what happens if we have a look at the regular final table? Same scenario. Versus 4-bet. Okay, so here it's basically 10s plus and ace-queen. Like ace jack is a good bluff, but he, he cannot stack off with nines or uh, lower or ace jack at all. So uh, this is a good uh, borderline to keep in mind. Also here he's folding more compared to uh, what we saw just now. So somebody mentioned in the chat that it's kind of hard to follow. I think I have explained what's going on. In this example, uh, we're looking at the same stacks for both scenarios. We have a final table, which is bounty, includes all the bounties. And then we have the same uh, final table with the same stacks, which is vanilla. Uh, and I'm just comparing what the hijack is playing versus low jack. To what he's doing in this example against the four bet jump from the low jack. This is what we are seeing. The next thing I have uh, noted here is a uh, big blind defend versus the cheap leader 
in both scenarios and then we'll have a look at his uh, range to induce uh, with 3-bet bluffing and 3-bet for value. So the big blind in this example has 32 big blinds versus 54 from MP who is the chip leader. So let's have a look. So this is the PKO final table. First of all, we see 47% votes. Let's compare this range to the regular final table range in the same scenario. Okay, so versus race first in, big blind versus MP. So here, MP race first in is actually 30% in the bounty scenario. I think it was like 20 uh, in the previous one. So let's compare our defense from the big blind. First of all, we see way less folding. This is something very crucial. Then we see uh, pretty much the same percentage of 3-bet jamming going on. But it's uh, happening with completely different hands. So in the example on the right, uh, in, a, in the vanilla scenario, when we have pocket kings, it's not strong enough. Uh, and also is king suited. It's not strong enough to 3-bet no no win and then call a no win. We cannot stack off profitably with kings or ace king suited versus the chip leader. So we, we just three bet jump. On the left example, we not only can stack off profitably with ace king suited uh, and kings, but we also can three bet stack off with ace queen suited, queens and jacks. And this is what allows us to go from 2% no no win three bet because we, we cannot induce so often in the vanilla final table, so we don't three bet no no win uh, often at all. But here we can induce a very wide range, and that's why our percentage goes from 2 to 6.3, along with uh, more defense we have, both suited and offsuit. We almost play all the suited hands against the chip leader in this example. Okay, what else? And then uh, we'll compare the low jack response versus the big blind 3-bet jam and uh, no no win 3-bet. Let's have a look. So the hijack was the second stack, if you remember. This is the example. So yeah, the low jack. So the low jack is the second in chips, 42 big blinds, and he covers by 10 big blinds to big blind in this example. So this is the low jack versus 3-bet from the big blind. Let's have a look. I'm going to compare this range to the range uh, when the big blind is 3-bet jamming. So this is the first example, and then we'll, we'll compare all this to the regular final table. Okay, low jack versus big blind. Let's have a look. So let's see. On the top, we have uh, the bounty final table. This is the 42 big blind stack versus 3 bet from the big blind. Keep in mind that this range is very wide, much wider than this one to start with. So basically, this range is about 50% weaker than this one and wider. So uh, in this example, he's facing a 3 bet no no win from the big blind and he's actually four bet inducing eight percent of the times so no no win four bet we see about eight percent of the times here and we compare this to the example below uh, in this example it's the vanilla final table same scenario we raise from the low jack big blind three bets us no no win and we see we have zero no no win four bets we either play go fold or jump that's it but here we actually jump so rarely that I think we can simply play a 4-bet no-no win, co or fault. We can remove the jamming portion. This is in line with what I said earlier, that we want to be making sure we induce way more in uh, bounty, not only at the final table, in general, in the whole tournament. We want to be inducing way more, way wider than here. Like here, the uh, low jack doesn't really benefit a lot from inducing wider because if, uh, for example, we use with a hand like queens or jacks and uh, even if the big blind just uh, four bet jumps a hand like ace five suited against us then it's not a spot that we really want to play and take because it's for 80 percent of our stack pretty much so if if we happen to lose here we are actually uh, one of the shortest stack uh, stacks at this point so this is the reason we want to preserve our stack and play very carefully in a vanilla scenario. But in bounty scenario, 
we want to make sure we induce a lot. We, we want to take a lot of chances. We want to be taking the close spots. And this always because uh, we play for the bounties and we're so close to winning the whole tournament and collecting the extra payout for first place. Let's have a look at what we defend versus 3-bet non win So here we were supposed to be starting uh, to defend from the suited 10x region and those hands are basically 0 EV. That's why we see some uh, faults from Queen 10 suited, Queen Jack suited. So this is around the borderline. Ace 9 off is close to that as well. These uh, low pocket pairs, they're 0 EV as well. Uh, and let's have a look here. Uh, nothing to do with the defend before. So we still go 40%, but this is from a 50% wider range. And also you can see how low we can go. Uh, we call uh, King 6 suited plus, Queen 8 suited plus. We call any suited connector we have in our range. We are not uh, really expanding in the off aces region, which is kind of intuitive because these hands generally they don't perform well uh, basically post-flop versus a wide range. They perform well versus a tight range because we can spike the ace and uh, win the pot. But uh, when villain induces with such a wide range, then it's not a good idea to defend ace nine off. So uh, yeah, this is uh, the main uh, differences. And also let's have a quick look at what we do against uh, big blind three bet jump in the same example. In the example below, uh, we're facing a three bet jump in the vanilla scenario. So this is the range we can profitably play. And this is a three bet jump in the bounty scenario. So uh, we go as low as sixes sometimes, uh, sevens plus always. Ace queen off is mandatory. It's actually making quite a good profit. Ace 10 suited is zero EV, but we still play it sometimes. So we go much wider here. And I think it's useful to see uh, the big blind strategy when we play versus the low jack. Once again, to see mostly the three bets and three bets non no win and three bet jumps. So this is the final table, the PKO final table range from the big blind here versus low jack. And uh, this is going to be the last thing for today. Then we'll move to the questions part. Okay. Big blind versus low jack. All right. So let's compare these two. On the left, we have the bounty. We already know that we are going to be defending much wider in the bounty scenario. For a few reasons, we are facing wider, weaker race first in range. And our bubble factor or risk premium is lower at the bounty final table compared to the regular one. So this is the first thing. Uh, and we already know that we can be expanding a lot our uh, value three bet range. So we go as low as tens or jacks. Uh, Jax plus, ace queen suited uh, is strong enough as well. And then on the right, we have only 2.6% non no win 3 bets compared to 8.8 .8 on the left. So yeah, this is very important. I do think in practice though, we have to be very careful because I think the majority of the average players, they will be probably not opening wide enough in a bounty, which means their range is going to be stronger to start uh, the hand preflop when they're in the low jack first team. Uh, on top of that, they will be not just comfortably four bed jamming as many bluffs from the suited low ASX region. But on the other hand, I think they will be under defending versus three bet. Like we won't see anyone uh, defend queen eight suited or king eight suited or uh, Maybe even 6-5 suited, some people will fold uh, in the low jack shoes when they face a big blind, big blind 3-bet. I'm sure the majority of the people will fold hands like Ace-10 or face jack off, which means that we have a very profitable 3-bet no-no win from the big blind, but this also goes for a regular final table. Okay, so that was everything I wanted to show you today. And, and uh, next time I'll be finishing with one more example for a final table place and comparison. And then we'll move to some uh, post-flop examples. And I think this is this part four will be our final webinar. Uh -huh. It's not a question, but we, we really have to be aware of uh, the people's tendencies and uh, not just play a GTO, a pure GTO, because uh, sometimes pure GTO, especially at the lower stakes, can be very misleading. So uh, keep in mind that. And uh, I think generally 
a solid uh, strategy or uh, as, as this has been working for years for one of the most profitable players online, uh, C. Darwin. He's really focusing on uh, having a very wide race first in range and playing small pots at the final tables. So I think this is something that still works until today, even at the PKO final tables, even as a mid stack, even uh, as a big stack as well. Just uh, population doesn't trip at bluff enough in general at final tables, especially out of position. So be really careful when you go for these light four bet jumps or light four bet induces. They might not be the most useful thing when it comes to playing versus actual people. So I just wanted to, to touch on the GTO and how does it look. And then it's up to you to make the proper adjustments. Yeah. In other words, this is not a financial advice. <laughs> I expect the last webinar to be even more complex, actually. Be prepared for that and make sure to ask any questions if you are kind of lost in the middle of, of me explaining because uh, sometimes for me it's very easy to just, just go on uh, explaining what I what I have in mind, but uh, I keep forgetting that some of this uh, stuff are uh, more advanced and uh, need extra attention. Okay, I take it that I explained everything today and I didn't leave any room for questions, which is great. I really enjoy uh, when this happens. So uh, it's kind of automatic good feedback for me. You, ex you, you get everything that I explained. That's, that's perfect. Okay, guys, in that case, let's meet the next time. <laughs>